you guys. Thank you so much for uh, coming to RustConf and to this talk today. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is actually my second uh, Rust conference period. Um, I was at RustFest at the beginning of the summer, and um, I'm really enjoying the community. Uh, so this is a talk about the web. Oh, this is me. I have a name. I do. Oh, uh, so what makes the web work? What makes it something that is so uh, useful to so many people? Well, there's a number of uh, aspects. One of them is that um, we have, anyone can get, if you have the internet, anyone can get on it. Um, so there's sort of an equality of access. Uh, we have cool stuff like universal resource locators um, that mean anything has a, a defined address. And uh, finally, there's something really cool, which is hypertext. Now, uh, hypertext um, kind of, to me, reminds me of the long efforts that people have made to cite other texts in their works. And traditionally, the way that you would do this is with a quotation. Um, most like works of famous literature, uh, especially when there were not many works of famous literature, were so well known that you could just uh, use the same words and have that be uh, a sort of accepted method of referring to another work and calling in all of its, uh, all of its echoes into your own. Uh, later, you know, as uh, there got to be much more literature in the world and uh, we needed a more rational method of, of uh, organizing it, we developed the citation. Um, but hypertext was something a little bit different. What did hypertext give us that's different from earlier technologies? Instant gratification. Uh, so rather than having to um, look up a citation, you know, perhaps a very uh, lengthy period, um, you could go from document to document as fast as your internet speed would allow. Uh, so who is it that we have to thank for this miracle? Uh, it is our favorite gentleman, Tim Berners-Lee. I would like to thank him for so much, most of all uh, the internet and the web that we all know and love, but also for um, just being a very unproblematic man for about 30 years. He's like an Anglican vicar. Uh, he's involved in charity. He's been married to the same woman for like 22 years. Seriously, uh, we, we stand an unproblematic king. Uh, so this um, slightly minimized screenshot, perhaps you may recognize it. This is uh, famously the first page of the web. Uh, and those beautiful little blue links um, are the only form of interactivity on this document. They are the only thing that you can do with this document, uh, which is great and all, but. Uh, so HTML came out in 1993, uh, and almost immediately the quest began to make the web interactive. Uh, basically, these, um, this, this instant gratification of uh, having all the content linked from one document to another uh, made people start wishing they could do more things with these documents. Um, made people uh, want to expand the capabilities of what they were looking at. Uh, and, of course, um, the people who wrote HTML are not necessarily the ones who began this job of uh, trying to make web pages interactive. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee was a, a physicist working for CERN. Um, he doc the document model was something that uh, probably was enough for him for a while, but not for a lot of internet users. Uh, so this also quite, quite small screenshot um, is of a Java applet. So Java applets, oh man, they came out so early. They were released with the first version of Java because uh, like Java, um, even though we think of it as a like systems um, and like backend programming language, uh, always was trying to kind of bridge this gap between the server and the client. Uh, so um, one of the cool things about Java applets was, they, was that we were, they were delivered as Java bytecode, so they were quite small um, in terms of download size, while of course that does depend on whether you actually had Java already installed to your machine. You might have a very hefty download in between you and whatever piece of content you were looking at. Uh, so that's one of the like, slightly less user-friendly um, aspects of uh, Java applets, but there were some aspects that were really, really nice. Um, Java code obviously could run on any machine that ran Java, and what was the, the brag about like one billion devices running Java in 2000-something? Well, even back then, there were a lot of, lot of devices running Java. It was a solid option for um, that cross-platform cross interoperability that we're always chasing um, as developers. You know, you want to write it once and have it work everywhere. Um, 
it also uh, was very fast, just like until um, JavaScript started getting uh, optimized for performance in a variety of ways at the beginning of this decade, um, it was just a faster option to run interactive programs in the browser. Uh, but it was not the only option available for long. Um, this is like what I found when I Googled JavaScript 1996. Uh, it's just a little script tag there. Um, so JavaScript, of course, has um, an origin story that is famous or perhaps notorious to us all. Uh, so um, Java was instantly becoming very popular, almost from the moment of its release, because it was filling a need that many developers had, um, both to uh, have relatively accessible server-side programming and to, again, bridge that gap between server and client. Uh, this concept was gathering so much steam that um, Netscape, uh, which had, was trying to release its Mosaic killer, Mozilla, a browser at the time, um, and somebody's gonna get my, I'm gonna get my facts wrong somewhere in here, and somebody is gonna have direct personal experience in this audience, I know it. But uh, the, there was so much urgency that uh, Brendan Eich famously wrote this prototype in 10 days. Uh, so we wound up getting um, JavaScript uh, released um, by the end of 1995. Um, so basically shortly after the release of Java. Um, it was not called JavaScript at first. I think that was like a, a slightly later uh, version that they, you know, of course, they called it JavaScript to kind of hang on to those coattails of Java. Um, to this day, confusing people who are very smart, like my mother. You know, she's really smart, but she just can't remember that one. Uh, one of the other interesting things about JavaScript is that unlike Java, which um, was sort of a general use programming language um, with sort of an API for putting up a like applications, uh, JavaScript was designed from the ground up with, the, uh, with HTML in mind. Um, JavaScript was designed to manipulate HTML. Um, and that, I think, is an important aspect to its later success. Another important aspect to its later success was how much people started trying to copy it. Um, like, uh, this was an era of like, all proprietary code. Nobody was sharing their code. Well, maybe not nobody, but none of these people were sharing their code. Uh, so for Microsoft to actually uh, get uh, a, their own JavaScript version up, they basically just looked at what was running in Netscape browsers and copied it and re-implemented it with their own engineers, um, which is like very 1996, but also kind of a crappy way to work. Uh, but then we have, oh God, most blessed, there's one other very popular option for interactivity on the web and it is Flash. This is an old Flash website. So Flash came out almost right after JavaScript. They are like on each other's heels because clearly this is the movement. This is what people want out of this brand new technology called the web. Uh, so one of the cool things that I found out when I was researching this talk is that um, Flash was actually developed by a, it was called Future Splash, which I guess became Flash. And uh, it was developed by a company called Future Wave that um, was clearly chasing every trend in the computing space because they had started out making like pen, pen vector drawing computers because pen computers were the hot shit of 1993. Uh, but it, they were not the hot shit of like 1994 or 1995. So um, basically this company took this like animation studio that they had developed and they took the viewer for it which in a very fortunate uh, development for them was very lightweight and could easily be bundled up and uh, delivered as an extension to web browsers. Um, so this and the fact that Flash had an amazingly accessible toolkit, because again, it hadn't been originally developed for like technical users, coders, as opposed to the earlier technologies that we're talking about, which while they were relatively user-friendly scripting languages, still had that barrier of um, assuming that somebody knew how to code before they started using them. Uh, so Flash really became a colossal success um, until, of course, Steve Jobs killed it with the iPhone because the iPhone won. And Flash, when it, it, it not supported on the iPhone, could not succeed. Uh, this is despite um, some very legitimate attempts that Flash made to uh, converge um, back into uh, the JavaScript standard with uh, something like ActionScript. 
um, which was a, an implementation of, I think, an early ECMAScript spec, uh, but they never brought them back together, and Flash, unfortunately, died, or did it? This is a screenshot I took, like, yesterday from um, a paper doll game that was released uh, about three weeks ago. Um, Flash has, still has an incredibly active and uh, passionate uh, user base and community. Um, it just doesn't include any of the people who probably are first on your mind when you think of internet users. Um, but there are still like children and artists and uh, people who have just developed a lot of skills in this area who are unwilling to let go of this proprietary format. And uh, to me, the fact that like Flash has this community Java applets don't, uh, even though they both represent sort of proprietary formats, um, really speaks to me how much success Java, uh, Flash's accessible tools uh, gave it. And uh, I think there's a lesson there for all of us about keeping our tools as accessible as, as we can within reason. Um, that, I think, is the way that most projects find success. So uh, all of this together was the birth of the web platform because these competing uh, visions of what interactivity on the web was going to look like ignited uh, what we call the browser wars. Um, and this was basically a like, triangular conflict between um, browser vendors, uh, browser users, and application developers. Uh, the browser vendors wanted to offer features that would be so attractive to the users that they would choose their browser and not somebody else's. But application developers wanted their programs to run on every browser uh, with the same behavior. Um, this conflict eventually led to uh, the creation of ECMAScript, which is not in itself a language so much as it is a specification for a language. And basically, ECMAScript was developed by looking at all the disparate JavaScript implementations that existed at the time and trying to uh, find the commonalities in them uh, at, so that they could be uh, defined um, so that anyone could use them. So that in the future, if somebody were coming up with a new browser, they wouldn't have to uh, just like kind of feel out how JavaScript is supposed to work. They could actually know how it's supposed to work defined standards that if they meet, they know that uh, they're offering a good experience both to uh, developers and to users. Uh, so that said though, our, this birth was much less like this and much more like this. Uh, Saturn eating his own children. It was a brutal conflict, red in tooth and nail. And uh, as we all know, there were casualties like Netscape. Um, but there were also huge wins for the community. Um, this open source governance model uh, was so successful with JavaScript that, that for that reason and for other reasons, it began to be the accepted way of developing software that you wanted a wide variety of people to use. This was an era of increasing standardization, um, both with like IETF standards uh, for like web and internet um, technologies and for uh, standardization of stuff like the, the W3C was actually predates the browser wars slightly because it um, existed to standardize HTML, uh, even before um, anyone was thinking of trying to standardize JavaScript. Uh, so, um, JavaScript has won, right? Uh, nobody out here is writing Java applets seriously, to my knowledge. And uh, Flash, while we've uh, established that people are still using it quite actively, um, it is obviously deprecated by uh, all the major browser vendors. Um, and has no support on the mobile devices that we consider to be so important in this day and age. Uh, but God, JavaScript. Man, I've been writing JavaScript for like five and a half years now. People pay me to do it and everything. And it's fun a lot of the time. It's fun because of how close JavaScript is to me. Anytime I want to, I can just open up a terminal and there's my REPL. Wow, that's, that's pretty neat, that's pretty easy. But uh, there are other aspects of the JavaScript experience that are not so good. Um, performance, of course, is one of them. Uh, JavaScript is a scripting language. It has to run inside like a small subset of your um, computer's resources. Uh, and while browser vendors are always trying to optimize for the way that people write JavaScript, this does create a sort of situation where there's a bit of tail chasing. Um, JavaScript vendors optimize uh, common patterns and then kind of institutionalize uh, um, what might or might not be good programming behavior. 
So many people don't want to write JavaScript. But on the other hand, the web seems to have won. More and more applications that uh, in a previous era would have, been, um, would have been native applications, perhaps on your desktop computer, are now web applications. So uh, what's a person to do if they want to write performant code that runs like native, perhaps with uh, all of the other, uh, all of the features that JavaScript notably lacks, like any kind of internal coherence? Well, uh, people started feeling out this problem almost immediately. JavaScript, of course, uh, has not been popular among large swaths of the community. So one of the original um, solutions that people came up with was asm.js. Uh, Asm.js basically took advantage of a number of like performance hacks uh, of JavaScript, stuff like um, doing a doing um, adding bitwise operators to all of the integers you were using in JavaScript code, which was a hack that would make them uh, be treated like um, more like native uh, data structures than like JavaScript data structures. Um, so what asm.js basically was, though, was um, kind of a hack for people who didn't want to write JavaScript to not write JavaScript. They would write C or C++ or maybe even Rust, actually, uh, because those timelines do sort of overlap, um, and just run a compilation step on it that would turn it into JavaScript that uh, boasted native performance owing to how it was optimized. Um, but that was not the only uh, proposal for uh, getting native level performance um, in a seamless way in web browsers. Um, there was also the Google Native Client, uh, which was abbreviated as NACL, like salt. So there were a lot of pretty bad pepper jokes, like salt and pepper, for their project names. Uh, bless all Google employees. Um, so this actually is like quite an old project. Uh, 2011, I don't know, I feel like that was forever ago. Like I, was, I was young then. Um, and uh, this was a Chrome-only solution, not shockingly, because it was a it was a it wasn't a proprietary uh, Google product exactly. But uh, to quote uh, somebody from Mozilla in like 2012, um, it, it was an open specific it lacked an open specification beyond its Chrome implementation. Uh, so there was basically no way that um, people were going to really adopt a Google Native client. Uh, unless Chrome became the only browser that people used. And that is not what happened. Uh, we actually exist in a relatively stable and pleasant situation of a variety of browsers competing quite fiercely against each other, um, but fortunately for users in a much safer and more satisfying way than in the late 90s. Uh, and part of that, I think, is because we have technologies like this next one, WebAssembly. So WebAssembly actually comes directly from the same open governance structures that were established um, to govern JavaScript at the end of the browser wars. Uh, so it is, again, defined as a specification, as a standard. Um, and basically, it defines two uh, formats, um, one of which is like just binary. I can't read it or make sense of it. You probably can't either, no matter how like, good your brain is. Um, and then the other one is a more comprehensible and maybe kind of human readable and editable uh, assembly-like format, um, which uh, you can hand edit if you would so choose, but that's probably not what you want to do. You probably want to write code in something like C, C++, Ruby. No, not Ruby. Why did I just say that? I meant Rust. Uh, and uh, it was initially, the initial features were based on the um, asm.js feature set. Uh, so again, this kind of um, model of looking at what exists out there, um, implementing all of its features, and then trying to supersede it, uh, which we see again and again you know, in computing. That's how we work. We want to make something better, and then we want to uh, make it much better. We want to extend what it does beyond what was already possible. So WebAssembly is so brand spanking new it was announced in 2015. We had a first uh, like Unity demo in 2016, and the initial release was already in 2017. So that was like last year, uh, and now here we are in the middle of this year. Um, it is actually just blowing up in terms of like interest. Uh, I was at Rustfest at the beginning of the summer, and somebody did a talk on you. A uh, I think it's still not quite production ready. But the mere notion that you can have uh, now a web framework where you write both uh, 
server side and client side code in the same in the same uh, language, and then have it compiled into JavaScript. Wow, that is so neat. I have been a web developer for so long. Uh, one of the things that we are always chasing is isomorphism. This notion that we could have code that will run the same both on the browser and on the server. Uh, and why would you want this? Well, every time I write something like a form validation, that's logic that I have to duplicate both in my JavaScript and in my uh, Python, Ruby, Rust, Java, Go. Well, that frankly sucks. First of all, the person writing the Python, Ruby, Rust, Go uh, might very well not be the same person who writes that JavaScript. Um, and they will certainly probably not be the same people maintaining it. Um, it is just as we, if, if you saw uh, um, Isis and Chelsea's talk earlier about trying to maintain parity between uh, Rust and C implementations of a complex bit of logic, no matter how many smart engineers you have, it probably just can't be done. So uh, having code that is truly the same, um, that runs the same with the same assumptions uh, is something that I have been interested in for a long time. And I sort of, I, I, I taste it coming with uh, WebAssembly. It's so close. Um, and there's some tools I want to call out, uh, especially in uh, the Rust community. Um, one of them uh, is Wasm BindGen, which is what we use to uh, sort of pass functions and data structures um, over that uh, Rust uh, WebAssembly border. Uh, and then we have um, Wasmpack, uh, which is an incredibly cool tool that uh, lets you package up um, Rust as NPM modules. Uh, so you can have uh, your Rust code running in a browser um, extremely easily with a minimum of setup from you. So uh, now this brings, us, this brings us to me, actually. That's not me, that's Ashley. But I'm here because of Ashley. Uh, because Ashley tweeted at the beginning of the summer about a program called Rust Reach, uh, which was basically intended to give people who were not currently involved in Rust um, some mentorship, a project to work on, uh, and try to get them more involved in the Rust community. Uh, one, as we've reviewed, the success of a language is defined by how many people are interested in using it and how many people find it easy to use. Uh, so one of the great things that's built into Rust is trying to uh, both treasure the human element and take out the uh, importance of any one individual contributor so that projects are more sustainable for a long time. Um, like in Python, just this last year, we had a big maintainer step down uh, because of the exhaustion um, that is involved in um, working on these projects so long and so hard with so little reward. So the broader a base of people that we get into uh, this Rust and WebAssembly community, the more likely that this standard is going to be successful because it hasn't won yet. Uh, so the, this also so tiny screenshot um, is just a couple of my friends from Rust Reach uh, having our weekly call where we talk about our projects and what we were working on. Um, one of those people is in the audience, Crystal. Hey, girl. Uh, and I just want to say that this experience was incredibly important to me because, like I said, I've been a web developer for like almost six years now. Um, I never thought that systems level programming was something that I could do. Not because I didn't think I had the brains for it or something, but just because I was out of college. Where was I gonna get that kind of training? Was I gonna go back to school just to learn assembly? No. But um, Rust was kind of here when I needed it. And Rust was welcoming to me when I needed it to be welcoming. And uh, there is so much that I've learned just about how computers really work from um, this last summer's experience of working on, with Rust, it's, it's like a whole new computer science education um, for somebody who really missed that experience in college. Uh, so I also wanna talk again a, a little bit about those tools that we have in Rust and WebAssembly. And I want to shout out to um, Nick Fitzgerald, Fitzgen, uh, who is really a leader in the Rust Wasm working group. Um, and has also been very personally welcoming to me and to my contributions um, on these projects. Basically, all I've been doing so far is a little bit of documentation here and there. Um, but despite that, nobody expected me to come in with like some great groundbreaking PR, and I wouldn't be accepted unless I refactored the whole language on my first day. 
which definitely was always my fear with OSS. Uh, but it wasn't the case, at least in this community. Um, people were in, encouraged me to ramp up slowly and gave me the space I needed uh, to get comfortable with what I was looking at. Uh, so that also means that I started working on um, something we call the, uh, the Game of Life tutorial in Rust Wasm. Now, the Game of Life, uh, Conway's Game of Life, if you're familiar with it, um, is a fun sort of computational game with simple rules. Um, as you can see, we have a grid with cells. Um, the rule is that any cell with uh, two or three neighbors, any live cell with two or three neighbors survives. If it has a different number of live neighbors, it dies. And a dead cell with exactly three neighbors will become alive. So this is something that you can run at every step. Um, and depending on the size of the grid, it can become quite computationally intensive, which makes it a very fun uh, test case for um, WASM. Now, it is such an interesting test case that, can anyone read this? Is it too small? Yeah, so uh, I had a different computer up until like two years ago. This is a little 2011 MacBook Air that's uh, doing its utmost with its four gigs of RAM. I cannot actually compile the upper uh, levels of the game of life on my computer, um, which is a really fun, cool problem that has prevented me from doing the live demo that I wanted to do at this talk. But I think you guys will forgive me, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, so that kind of brings me to uh, another project I worked on, which was just um, to uh, automatically generate um, uh, readmes for the uh, exported uh, TypeScript files that are generated when you run some Rust code through WasmPack. And I'm still working on that. I learned a lot about NOM and like parsing in Rust, and it's a real joy, but like multi multiple functions in one file aren't working right now. It's okay. It's okay, we'll keep working on it. Uh, and for that, I actually want to really thank uh, my friend Michael Gatozzi, uh, who worked with me on that project, and he was my mentor throughout uh, RustReach. Um, because, again, he really did the work of uh, letting me know that I could do this and uh, helping me with it in a very empowering way. Uh, so this might be familiar to you. It was linked from the very bottom of that screenshot I showed you earlier. This is the original How Can I Help page of the web. Because Tim Berners-Lee baked that in to uh, that first web page. This call for contributions, this call for help, this call for, uh, for, for um, making things better than they are right now. And that's the exact same thing we need right now with Rust and WebAssembly. We're getting more and more users, we're getting more and more interest, but we need still more people so we can solve things, like this problem I have where I can't compile on a machine with four gigabytes. Like, that's solvable. Maybe I can't solve it, but I think maybe one of you can. And that is the thing that keeps me so endlessly excited about technology, the internet, and the web. There is always someone out there who wants to solve your problem. Maybe they can solve it better than you ever could have thought of doing it. But you don't know until you reach them. You don't know until you convince them that uh, helping out is in their interests as well as yours. And uh, that instinct to uh, improve the tools that we have in a way that uh, is helpful to everyone around us is what has really built uh, the internet that we know and love, and that I think has brought us all together here today. Uh, so I'm really grateful to the people who have worked on all the technologies that support the technologies that I write now. Uh, because it has, taken, it has taken not just a village, but an entire world of programmers, years and years, to get to this point that we are. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. And I'm like literally looking at some of my giants right in this audience here. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have any, if you want to argue about what I said or just like give your thoughts, uh, hit me up online later. Thank you guys.